Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, otherwise known as 4BX257, here to bring you another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. And today I'm going to be taking a look at the G.I. Joe's multi-shot grenadier, the 1988 Hard Ball. Now like a lot of 1987 and 1988 characters, he does not make any cartoon appearances, but he makes his first comic book appearance in the Old Wolf Comic Run of G.I. Joe in issue number 80. Now, normally I don't really talk about the file card, I put that on the end of my review so that you, the viewer, can read it at your leisure. But there are quite a number of things I want to discuss just right off the bat before I get to the toy. And one of them is the file name, Wilmer S. Duggleby, which is not really a, a real name, not even close, but it sounds a lot like Abner Doubleday, which is the creator, well, supposed creator, of the baseball game. Nobody can. Nobody really has a consensus on who actually made the uh, baseball game. And as of you can see, Hardball is a baseball-themed character, and it actually continues on in his file card, such as his uh, place of birth is Cooperstown, New York, which is the home of the Baseball Hall of Fame. But one of the most interesting things that really sticks out in my mind when I read this file card is his whole reason for joining the GI Joes, which I'll read right now. After five seasons of playing center field in the minor leagues, Hardball came to the realization that the big league scouts just weren't interested in athletic prowess. They wanted star quality. Now, by star quality, they mean the scouts were looking for individuals who stuck out beyond their teams, which doesn't really, really sound very fair because, well, as you know, baseball is a team sport. And the whole line just kind of sounds, well, just sort of bitter or reactionary. Of course, it's the type of mature writing that you get from Larry Hama, a famous comic book writer who, of course, did the file cards. And it kind of made me wonder whether he was reacting to something which was going on in 1987, which is, you know, when a 1988 figure would have been designed. And the only thing that I can come up with is... In 1987, that was the year for, for the whole decade of the 80s, which has the most home runs in Major League Baseball. It, it's quite a jump in number of home runs just in that one year. And I can kind of understand that even if you weren't interested in sports, I guess a lot of news reporters might have just emphasized really on the batters who are making those home runs. Sorry about the massive digression there, but let's take a look at Hardball's accessories, starting off with his primary weapon, with the contents list on the card simply calls a multi-shot grenade launcher. It looks to be an overly detailed version of a real military weapon, the Armscore MGL. Hardball's grenade launcher is actually a two-piece design, with the revolver-like drum being able to be removed, so you can actually see a lot of the detail there. One very interesting thing about the cylinder that Hardball's MGL uses is that it's an eight-round shot, whereas the Armscore MGL that this thing is based on would only have been a six-round. Very interesting, and even though this is a very subtle detail, it actually just goes to prove that almost all of the G.I. Joe's weapons and vehicles are a little bit OP, even when they're based on real military gear. And of course, it can actually spin around. The only other accessory that Hardball has is a backpack. As you can see, it's loaded up with what I'm guessing is 40 millimeter grenades. A very interesting detail, the big US symbol right there on the flap. Now, I totally understand why some collectors really don't like sport-themed action figures that are supposed to be in the military. And unfortunately, Hardball is one of those figures which is really hard to ignore. Not only is the entire upper half of him kind of baseball-looking, but his file card also carries on that theme, whereas some sport-themed figures actually don't really do it to that extent. However, I actually think that Hardball's is really very subtle and actually goes very well with the rest of his army themed military stuff. I mean sure, the white is kind of bright, but let's face it, the white and the blue is not that much different than what you would see on maybe a navy figure. 
And I really like the detail of the G.I. Joe logo on his breast pocket there. Well, actually, there's no pocket, but it's just like a breast uh, tag. It's really nice. I kind of wish it was a little bit bigger, but it's nice that it's kind of small and in scale with how big it would be on a real person. There are a few unfortunate things about the figure, like um, a lack of paint in some regards. Now, you'll see that right in the V here, he should have had something in there. Now, according to the card artwork, as you can see, the V, like, there's nothing in there. That would have just been uh, flesh colored. So that would have been, that should have been either a flesh color or maybe the gray to continue down the inner portion of his jersey. One very interesting thing is the huge canteen on his back here. It sticks out quite a bit there. So sometimes when you're putting the uh, backpack on there, it's actually touching and rubbing up against the top of the canteen, which is kind of unfortunate. I kind of wish uh, that was a bit flatter so that the backpack could be fit in there rather more securely. And while he has even more of these 40 millimeter grenades, it's rather unfortunate that the straps holding in those grenades are not painted. They should have been the same green as his holster and belt. It's once again something that you can see on the card art, but was unfortunately not carried over onto the figure, probably just for budgetary reasons. Another thing visually in his favor is the fact that his weapon actually covers up his chest quite nicely. So honestly, if you look at him, he's really no different than what a Delta operative or maybe a private contractor would look like. Sure, he's maybe missing some straps to go along with his backpack, but that's only a minor detail. Speaking of extra web gear that the figure could have had, in the animation for the commercial for the Series 2 action packs in 1988, the mortar launcher is shown with Hardball, but Hardball is incorrectly animated. He has the chest of Repeater, which is very odd because Repeater is also in that commercial. Honestly, it looks really good, and there has been a custom floating around, which is actually a fairly easy thing to customize Hardball into. As I noted in my 1988 RPV review, I think Hardball actually makes a very good driver for this vehicle because his brown pants and white shirt actually match the colors of the RPV very well. On top of that, you have enough space in this little crevice here for his accessories. Of course, with his brown pants and white shirt, he is actually a very good driver or even co-driver for a lot of desert vehicles anyway. If there's one negative thing I can say about Hardball is that I really wish that his multi-shot grenade launcher actually had a hollow cylinder with removable 40 millimeter grenades. I mean, they're just basically little cylinders at that size, so it wouldn't have been really that hard to mold and place in there. It, the barrel wouldn't have even have to have been like hollow for it to, to come in and out. They, this thing still could have been solid. I think removable little grenades would have been a really cool play feature for this action figure. Not that he needs any more grenades because in addition to the eight which are molded in the cylinder, he has a whopping 27 all over his body here. So just who does Hardball take over from on the G.I. Joe side? Well, I know a lot of collectors actually compare him to the 1985 Bazooka, which uh, seems like they're more or less comparing two guys with jerseys on. But I think the whole problem is, is that a lot of people are misunderstanding Bazooka's rocket propelled grenade launcher here. Rocket propelled grenades are actually closer to missiles in the way that they're armed, which is different from how grenades are. So this isn't really a fair comparison, to be honest. The only other figure to actually come with a grenade launcher as his primary weapon and not uh, some attachment or like, like a separate thing is way back in 1983, we have our first Marine, Gung Ho, who has a grenade launcher, a single shot to be sure, but he also came with grenades actually molded onto his legs. And even though he is primarily a jungle recondo, so that's really his specialty, so just who would Hardball's rival on the Cobra side be? Well, the first action figure that I want to compare him to is not a Cobra, but actually a Dreadnought. 
1986 Monkey Wrench. And while Monkey Wrench has this weird spear gun thing as his primary weapon, well, his only accessory to be honest, his specialty was explosives. And in the cartoon, you can actually see him using these grenades, which are very prominent on this bandolier across his chest. He's often forgotten as a, the explosive expert on the dreadnought side simply because he doesn't come with an accessory which really emphasizes that point. Rather unfortunate. But on the Cobra side, we have our first Cobra grenade thrower, the 1989 Frag Viper. A very odd looking figure, but it's something that I will get to review very shortly. One very interesting thing, however, the matchup between these two is very odd because he is actually wearing uh, brown army pants and some blue on the rest of his baseball themed outfit. And so is the Frag Viper. If you're looking for a hardball on the aftermarket, he is actually a fairly easy figure to find, complete with all of his accessories and for a very low price. Unfortunately, it's a low price because a lot of collectors just really can't get past the whole sports theme on some of these action figures. Which is really unfortunate because, like I said, I think this figure has a lot of potential. Not just as a Navy figure, but as a desert themed driver or co-driver for a lot of vehicles which didn't have a driver. However, there are at least two things you do have to look out for. And while he's actually a fairly sturdy figure, the paint job on his chest specifically the G.I. Joe logo, is something which is fairly easy to rub off. Also, the top half of this MGL here has some problems. As you can see, it has this very, very thin um, portion for the stock. And as you can see, mine is a bit, a bit stressed. And that's fairly easy to crack off. Uh, same thing with this odd little detail on the side here. I don't know really what this is, like a caulking handle or something like that. But this is something which also cracks off as well. It's not a real. It's not really a detail which actually does anything. So I mean, if it's missing, I have no great loss. But still, if you want something which is a hundred percent, you do have to look out for these tiny little things. multi-shot Grenadier, the 1988 portions in the cylinder. But the fact of the matter is that a rocket pelt pel the Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.